This is Michael from Blue Sky Bio. I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us for tonight's webinar presentation. Anybody that has questions during the presentation is, entered, is encouraged to enter them into the QA chat box that's to the right of the viewing screen. Please make sure to complete the webinar attendance form in order to receive your CE credit. Links to the form can be seen below the viewing window and also have been sent via email together with the viewing links. Tonight's webinar presentation is the first part of a four-part series that's going to be delivered by Joe Ambrose at Roe Dental Lab. Joe is the head of the Guided Surgical Department at Roe. Roe and Joe in particular have been involved in guided surgery pretty much from the beginning of guided surgery. They have a wealth of experience and have handled a tremendous number of cases and are going to be sharing part of that experience and knowledge with us tonight. Roe is a longtime partner of Blue Sky Bio, and I would highly recommend them for many, for any guided surgical cases and generally for dental lab work. Tonight, Mr. Ambrose is going to be presenting on the topic of CT scanning and mapping virtual and mapping vital structures. Joe, please uh, go ahead. All right, thank you, Michael, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm honored to be here to speak with you tonight uh, from uh, tropical Cleveland, Ohio, uh, where it's a balmy uh, 45 degrees right now. Uh, but uh, tonight, uh, we're going to discuss CT scanning and virtual implant planning considerations. And what I'm going to try to uh, convey is uh, some of the things that you can look for uh, in getting your data ready and getting your data into the software and, and planning cases that can prevent you from having issues with inaccurate guides uh, and inaccurate implant placements and also help keep you away from vital structures uh, that are you know part of this uh, planning uh, protocol. So. First and foremost, the CT machine that you own or that you use should be calibrated properly and you should know your machine. These are general settings that we have for different systems that you see. Uh, up at cone, beams, cone beam settings in general take about a 0.4 voxel size. The average time is 20 seconds and you'll see field of view 140 and 170. Uh, stitched scans on small field of view 140 matrix 512 by 512 and all this information that you see on uh, this uh, picture right here uh, is available in your machines now by not using some of these or not making sure that your machine is calibrated properly uh, scans can be uh, inaccurate they can be hard to read uh, you, we may not be able to map vital structures properly and uh, you know sometimes couldn't even guarantee the outcome of a case uh, because the scan is just not uh, able to be uh, used properly. So there's a couple of uh, machines out here, uh, the Kodak system uh, should be uh, scanned at, at KV of 80 and MA of 2. Uh, which is different than other machines, so you really have to pay attention to the uh, the calibrations on the machine that you own. Now, I talked to some people, uh, various people, about this, and uh, there are some things that can affect the way the scan looks, and they are the KV uh, rate readings and the MA readings and MAS readings, and I'll explain what those are. Uh, for instance, the Galileo system. Uh, they have a particular issue uh, if, 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 if you have a Galileo's machine and you're not going to use their system of sending guides to, to their proprietary company that makes guides for them, then in or, they're, they're fine for patient scans, but if you have to use a scanning appliance uh, that is made in a laboratory or that you make, then you have to scan the scanning appliance inside of a special Serona aluminum scan box. 
and you'll see the part number right here, 6299759, it costs $185, and uh, that, that allows you to do the dual scans. Uh, again, if you decide that you are going to be using, uh, let's say, a third-party uh, company to make guides, we work a lot with the uh, Serona machine and at this point have good success with it. It's a good machine. Uh, we also can get ceramic fiducial markers from Serona, and here is the part number that you see, uh, 6310838. Uh, and now the scan cylinder, the, the Serona aluminum scan box, you'll see that they have a uh, MAS value of 42 right here. So that's a lot different than the Kodak system has. And uh, VO of 1. Plan Mecca, another machine. Uh, KV of 70 and the MA of 10. Now those numbers may or may not, and, and acronyms may or may not mean anything to you when you look at them, but all your machines have those settings on them. The companies from one company to the, to the next recommends using those uh, settings pretty religiously. And I'm going to go into uh, uh, a little bit about if, you don't, if you're not getting good scans, what could be the problem. So KV, what is KV? It's kilovolts. And that part of your controls uh, take, you know, it takes care of the quality of the scan. It's what controls the contrast or grayscale in the scan. So the higher the KVP, the lower the contrast, and the higher the KV, the lower the KVP, the higher the contrast. So I'm not saying that these settings can, you know, if you have certain situations where you might have uh, very small patients versus very large patients, that that's something that could be used to hone in on uh, controls the quantity or the amount of x-ray photons produced, basically uh, radiation, I suppose. Uh, and it controls the blackening or density on the scan. So since that, you know, that can change, let's say, depending upon uh, the, milli, the milliamps that you have on your machine or the setting that that has, uh, you know, that, that might be one reason why uh, when you try to read Hounsfeld units in the software that, that all the software companies say that you know, it's not an exact figure, it's just an idea of the bone quality. Traffic exposure equal to the product of the milliamperage. Basically what that means is exposure time, scan time. So when, when you have your machine set in a, at a certain MA, that dictates how much scan time uh, it takes to, to scan a patient in your machine. And most machines are set up for 20 seconds most of them some some have less but uh, or or for patients for radiation and they don't need the amount of radiation for a scan that a larger patient might need so factors that can affect a scan metal restorations in a patient's mouth equals scatter. And of all the things that in my experience that I experience, scatter is the biggest enemy. It prevents us from uh, doing things in the software that would make the registration of these cases easy. It makes the difference. scan versus having to make a scanning appliance. I'll show you some of that uh, uh, in a, some subsequent slides here. So scatter um, is not good. And if you don't know on which cases that you think that we need a scanning appliance for or not, I have criteria. You don't. Uh, as we all know, if, if the patient moves during a scan, that that can uh, really affect 
and pretty much make a case of failure uh, as far as having an accurate guide. And what you'll see when you see that is you'll see a, a shadow in the scan uh, as a double image. In other words, you might see a, a, a slice of a, a ridge and be a little off and you'll it'll almost look like two pieces in one so when you see that the patient has moved and uh, the chances of an accurate uh, uh, guide are pretty nil so that in my in my estimation if you see that in a scan or whoever you're working with to do this tells you that you have the patient that moved uh, if they ask you to uh, get get them another scan Uh, how all of how all of you operate with this uh, different companies that uh, you use, but all the machines have a calibration that they should meet, and uh, they probably when you bought your machine told you how often that these machines should be calibrated, and your rep should be able to come in and do that, or somebody from the company should be able to uh, come in and do that, and my suggestion is to have that done periodically and documented. When, when, you know the ones that are recommended that they're going to be accurate because uh, there's nothing worse than a a bad scan if if you if we if we produce a guide and the doctor calls up and says that the the placement of the implant isn't what the uh, uh, the virtual plan looked like and the doctor would say well the guide was seated everything was down I know it was correct it didn't move it could very well be machine calibration um, in the KV so pay very close attention to those two things if you have uh, scanning problems uh, call the call the company right away because they don't seem to get better uh, without somebody coming in and having a look at your machine one thing that I have found that uh, really helps is if you have a machine that uh, needs that has certain software in it from when you bought it uh, check to see when the next update is coming and make sure that the, the software updates uh, are used or are installed uh, t in a timely fashion uh, a lot of times software can cause problems that you can't change no matter what you try to do with the settings and one of the last things is something that everybody has control of the laboratory and the office is uh, the scanning appliance is not seated during the scan or it moves during the scan uh, things like that can uh, cause you to have to uh, uh, take a new scan it just you know uh, there's ways to tell if uh, these guides are seated we leave uh, little seating windows in it so that when the guide is placed in the mouth you can see that uh, the teeth contact the guide and you'll know that it's down uh, but that is uh, a very critical thing and we know when it happens in the software much common to uh, all machines is that the table height uh, set the table height so the mandible or maxilla is centered in the scan field and that has to do with field of view uh, and if that doesn't happen you may end up and it might have happened to you where uh, the laboratory or your scan or your uh, software company calls up and says that well we didn't get the bottom of the mandible it was cut off and we don't know how much bone is down there uh, things of that nature that can cause you to have to uh, rescan so uh, if if you are a doctor and you don't uh, do the scans, uh, I would suggest that you make sure that your staff knows what to look for and can operate the machine to get everything centered so that we can see everything we need to see in the software. All slices must have the same field of view, reconstruction center, and table height. Uh, scanning with a field of view that's too large. 
can cause a compromise in the re resolution of the formatted images and, and basically what that means is we've seen scans and you may have seen that on your televisions at time but that's what some of the scans look like so the view can uh, can affect that uh, as scanning with a field of view that's too small can cause the jaw not to fit in all of the axial images meaning that there's the field of view is just not big enough to capture the arch uh, not overlapping axial slices can reduce the quality of formatted images uh, and a, a big one here: this uh, scan with the uh, same splice or same slice spacing. Sli slice spacing must be less than or equal to slice thickness. Uh, the slice thickness should preferably be not larger than one millimeter. Now, uh, if we go larger than one millimeter, uh, the, the the scan tends to get distorted. Uh, we we have the same issue with pixelation sometimes that can happen. So when you uh, are in your machine, make sure that you have between five tenths and one millimeter of slice thickness uh, for accurate uh, planning. All these things that uh, that I've just mentioned, uh, and I'm going to mention these last few here, um, can affect the accuracy of your guides or can cause you to have to take new scans. All of the remaining teeth or scan prostheses should be completely visible in the images up to the occlusal plane so uh, you know you, we don't want to get scans in here that uh, there's only half of the the teeth visible in the scan uh, because we make measurements quite often uh, in these scans to see how much space we have between the top of the implant and an occlusal surface or an incisal edge uh, for some of the uh, prosthesis that are made uh, from these implant plans so seeing all the teeth is uh, is very important uh, in, in, in planning. The gantry tilt should be zero degrees and very important again is scan with arches separated at least 10 millimeters and simple cotton rolls can do that. Uh, I'm going to show you some pictures of, of what happens when you scan uh, with teeth together and some of the ramifications of that. Now all of these things that I've mentioned so far about scanning are things that have happened to us over the years. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time and done thousands and thousands of cases and um, uh, everything here has happened and has caused uh, scans to be have to be taken again. We had to do that very quickly. Uh, one note here uh, is something new with blue sky is uh, that it now is that we're now able to use compressed and uncompressed data, which is a it's a it's a that's a big uh, it's a big thing. It allows more uh, flexibility in in how we get data, and it causes less problems with having to call up and 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 tell you that uh, your data is not sent in the right format. We're going to see how we import scan data into software and register the dual scan. We're going to see how we import uh, uh, and register intraoral scans of the arch into the software. These scans are absolutely more accurate than stone models. Inaccurate stone models will, you know, can cause us not to have an accurate registration in the arch and not to have uh, uh, accurate uh, surgical guides. So I have two examples here that I'm going to show, and I have to open one. Is uh, a dual scan technique? And how critical it is that uh, fiducial markers are placed in the right positions, and why you know they uh, things can be inaccurate if we don't have this kind of uh, kind of criteria to use when we when we take scans. Okay.
So the first thing we do is we bring in the patient data. And we crop out areas that we don't need. This is an upper arch. So I'll go above the teeth, the lower teeth. And we just go take these little rectangles and define the area of interest that we want to use. And make it small enough so that it's we don't have too much information on the screen. Okay, so now we have this in place. Here you can see the fiducial markers. This doctor used probably more than he needed, but these little dots that you see right here are all the markers in place. You can see them in the top center view, in the axial view as they show up right here, like little light bulbs. And uh, that's what we're going to, that's, that is, this is the scan that's taken with the appliance in the patient's mouth. So the next thing we do is uh, go to file and import scan appliance. So I'll highlight the appliance file or folder. Hit OK. And we have the same picture where we're going to crop out what we don't need. And hit OK. So we have another screen that comes up. And in this screen, you want to be able to find the dots, find the markers. And we have done that. This some. And we want to see the dots in place and pick a size. So we go to this top right screen and you know I'll, I'll line these up and I try to make sure that the alignment is the same um, and, and, the, and the size of these are the same because we want the sizes to be somewhat similar and they look to be at this point these probably need to be a little bit bigger on the red ones. bottom left and here we see the actual scanning appliance as it was when it was made and you see the little markers right here show up in the palate of the denture and that's where they were placed for the scan. Now what we're looking for here is a very minus 500 typically around minus 400 gives us the image we want if we have cluttered up guide that doesn't look crisp and sharp and you can see it. This one I'm going to leave just as it is because it it looks great. Okay. So um, at this point uh, everything is done. This simply this particular screen on the bottom right is a way to manipulate these uh, markers so that one is superimposed over the other but if we look at those uh, everything looks great. There's no red, much red sticking out further than the white. Uh, to get it 100% perfect is, uh, you know, it's rare, but you, we can get 99.8% perfect, which is probably acceptable for that. So the patient markers, if you see at the bottom left, I'm going to hit patient markers, and that turns off the white. Provisory model happens to be the actual scan of itself. So when that's done, I will hit OK. And what the software is going to do is now place this guide right onto the arch in a position on the bone that is accurate so that when uh, this guide is placed over the ridge and on the tissue, uh, that it fits. That we're not going to be off with our markings or measurements and the guide will be accurate to the implants planned uh, in the case.
So that's uh, the dual scan process where you have to take two scans, one with the guide in the patient's mouth and one of just the guide by itself. Uh, that's the process we use to get it in software and at this point on this case, we're ready to plan it. Uh, a scanning appliance and after I show you this, went to why uh, this case doesn't need scanning appliances and I'll give you the criteria for when we need them and when we don't. This particular case uh, was and I'll show you the machines that we have for that here soon. So I'm going to look for this case in a new project. Take that one down, and here it is right here. So I'm going to choose data one, which I know works. OK. And here you see a familiar screen where we're going to crop out what we don't need of this arch. It's an upper. Now these uh, blue circles, we can rotate the arches with those. For instance, if somebody um, makes a scan where the patient's uh, plane of occlusion is tilted, we can rotate this until we have it where we want it as far as uh, the levelness of the plane or, or the, you know, how level it is to the horizon or the floor. And that helps. So I am again, I'm going to crop this out. And I think we have all right. That's one thing I want to do here. There, here it is uh, down in the bottom left. You can even see the patient's skin in these, and their face, and their lips. So there's a lot of information in a scan. So I'm going to get this scanned to the point where I can see the bone and the teeth accurately. The reason we were able to do this without a scanning appliance is I can see cuss tips everywhere. I can see incisal ledges. We have reference points uh, to how uh, all of this uh, lines up so that we can superimpose our model over this uh, 3D scan of the patient. So now, now that I have all this in the software, I'm going to uh, what we call import STL model, and we label this raw preparation scan. Okay, and it's in. You can see it here. I have to make the screen, but this is this is how it imports in. It's not in position whatsoever. So we have to then go to the alignment box on the right that you see and this is all under let's see da -da -da -da. model manipulation it's called right here on the bottom so this is a maxilla we want to have what's called we want to click points because we are going to choose points on the model and on uh, the patient scan that we can uh, used to uh, orient these or superimpose one over the other. So I would hit a line. And we have another screen that shows up similar to the one we had on the dual scan. And I like to use an occlusal surface view to do this, so I line both of these up very similarly and look for common areas in the scan that can be used. Okay, so uh, what I need to do is I'll, I'll push the shift button down on the keyboard and I'm going to go point for point and line these up uh, identically. So I'm on the molar here I'm going to use the cusp of Carabella as a point 
and on the first premolar I'll use the lingual cusp this little it's here little divot that you see in the tooth right here I can use that anything that you can see as a common spot I'll probably use it's six marks in here and I'll use uh, first premolar cusp tip and the cusp of carabella on the molar here also and with that I will hit OK and you can see that now that the model has been transferred to uh, be superimposed over the patient scan. And this was done with a digital impression machine that scanned the patient's arch, sent us an STL of that file, and we used that to uh, uh, import into the software for our patient model. Now these are uh, consistently more accurate than stone models and impressions. Now the way we check this, how do we know we're right? Uh, if you look and you see this blue outline around the teeth in the top left screen, we want to make sure that that outline hugs the teeth as we go around the arch. And I think you'll see that on all these, it does. And that we can feel safe that uh, and you'll look if you look in the top right, you also see how on the occlusal surfaces this uh, registration um, is accurate. If we had more time, and it's probably going to be in the context of a subsequent lecture that I have in this series, we'll go over how to fix this. If for some reason the registration is off a little bit, there are manual tools that you can use over. Uh, you know, in the software where it says adjust model position manually, there's other ways we can do it, but this is a very accurate registration here and we're going to be able to use it uh, to make the case. So those are the two ways that we get these cases into software and ready to plan. Okay, so let's go back to Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. TL models for us to use in the software. And there's eight here on the screen. These are the most popular ones, and they all work very well. And we've worked with just about all of them here in our software, and uh, you know, we know that, uh, you know that they're accurate and, and they're just fine. Now, the only difference is that if you choose to use these machines for your they go down all the way but uh, so far so good we try not uh, get these guides into undercuts when we do it this way so that when you get it back uh, it's gonna fit and and, you, and not have any issues with uh, going down to place but if for, for instance you're worried about that uh, my suggestion is to have your patient in quickly a couple days before surgery and so the scan appliance technique versus no scan appliance and this can have a major influence on uh, how these cases turn out uh, if you want to default if you want to be safe every time you do these make a scanning appliance but Scanning appliances cost money, they take more time to get the case done, and at this point in time, there's no reason to use them as long as we have what we need in a scan to, to do the no scan appliance technique. As I mentioned, uh, registrations. Scatter can prevent using the no scan appliance technique because, as you saw, when I registered that both of those are the, the case that had the teeth where we use the uh, scan, uh, digital impression model we had to find common areas on the uh, morphology of the teeth to that we used for the guide 
and here if you look on the bottom right you'll see scatter all over these teeth to the point where we can't accurately identify any of the cuss tips on the left side. angulation and position of the implants that you place in these positions that you see on the right side of the arch are going to be off. And uh, you may perforate a buccal plate, you may hit a root, things like that that can happen that makes it not worth it to take a chance. So uh, no scatter, on the other hand, uh, means that a scan appliance is not required. And you can see that we can identify cuss tips and incise alleged simple patient scan and produce a guide accurately. So when do you use a scanning appliance technique versus, or use a dual scan technique? Uh, first of all, uh, for the scanning appliance technique, we must always, on fully edentulous cases, we must always have a scan appliance. That's just uh, there's no way out. We don't have any. And the denture into the case so that we can see teeth positions. Now, on partially edentulous cases, uh, we use a scan appliance when multiple metal restorations are present in the mouth, more than three. And sometimes you can get away with more than four, but. Uh, if you have three to four metal restorations in the mouth, sometimes it's best to uh, use a scanning appliance technique. If you're not sure, you can send us a pen of the case and we can look at it and say, well, you know what we think it's worth. I think we'll, we'll probably be fine. Also, uh, when there's less six teeth mouth, we like to have scanning appliances. And also when there are teeth only present on one side of the mouth. We, we try to tripod these uh, scans into the, into the arch. And if we can't have uh, uh, common marks somewhere in the posterior on both sides and in the anterior, then it's kind of the uh, pitch in the yaw effect that because we had no way to to orient cuss tips or incisal ledges properly. So those are the criteria uh, when you would need a scanning appliance uh, for partially edentulous and fully edentulous cases. So the dual scan protocol. What do you do for these? Uh, the dual scan protocol requires two separate And the second scan is of the scanning appliance all by itself uh, taken with the scanning machine. And that would be oriented uh, on the chin rest with a piece of foam between the chin rest and the appliance. Uh, and you would orient the scanning appliance as if the patient were wearing it so that uh, we, we can get a common uh, 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 positioning uh, when we get these cases into the software. If uh, we're doing an upper and lower case, on the same patient, then uh, scanning appliance need to be made on both arches, possibly, and, and, and scanned. So what we, you know, the, the, what we suggest doing is to scan each arch separately. In other words, their lower teeth scan the patient. Uh, the uh, cotton rolls uh, help keep, you know, when a patient bites down, it keeps the, the appliance firmly seated so that uh, there's no chance that it's going to move and we have to have a rescan. So, uh, you know, once you would scan the upper arch, then you would do the same thing with the lower so that basically on scanning appliance scanned in the patient's mouth and two sets will contain uh, scanning a plant scanned all by itself. So if you happen to scan a patient with their teeth together, uh, that scenario increases the potential for scatter 
and hides the occlusal emergence tra trajectory of the implants in the 3D view, meaning we can't see uh, where these implants are occlusally in relationship to the teeth in the ridge. And here's a picture of that. So this patient was scanned with her teeth together. And once we planned the case, like you see in the bottom picture, uh, before I eliminated these teeth, uh, I, were, I was able to cut them out on this case. Uh, be, but before uh, I did that, you can see here that the upper teeth will not allow you to see anything about the occlusal position of the implants on the lower arch. So scanning teeth together is not a good thing. When we make the scanning appliances here, we make uh, them so that the teeth are in occlusion with the, with the opposing arch and that they're in a correct position so we don't have to worry about centric or people biting into uh, the teeth to, so that we know that, uh, that uh, the bite is correct. The bite isn't something that we have to worry about with scanning appliances. Scan appliance procedure. So uh, place the appliance in the patient's mouth, checking to make sure the appliance is fully seated. If you have to adjust it, it's okay to go in and grind just to make sure that we get it all down. And again, have the patient bite into cotton rolls placed over the posterior teeth, uh, keeps the, the guide uh, seated, and, and also keeps the arches separated. Scan the working arch only. Do not scan both arches. And I repeat this because it's, all these things are very important. And then you can perform the scan. And if you look here, you'll see space between the scanning events and the patient's arch. And you can also see the scatter on this case in these areas. And that's the reason we had to use the scanning appliance. So how does it show up in software? Well, in the 3D view, you can see it as a 3D object. And in the 2D view, you, you can see the space between the teeth. So what does that mean? It means how is this going to seat in the patient's mouth at the time of surgery, meaning that if this side is held down against the teeth and the surgery is done, that, that changes the position of the implant tube in the guide and it will change the uh, position of the osteotomy compared to the way the case was planned in the software. So how does all this happen? How do we get an inaccurate guide? Well, inaccurate impressions can cause it. Inaccurate software registrations of the appliance and appliance in patient's mouth. Uh, appliance not seated in the mouth accurately during uh, the scan. In all these instances, it's going to cause a rescan of the patient so that when we get these guides in the software, we don't see these gaps and spaces between the guide and the teeth like you see here on these two views. The no scan appliance protocol is. Uh, first of all, when we use it, uh, we only use it on partially edentulous cases. We use it when there are less than four restorations in the mouth. Uh, we use it when more than six teeth exist in the arch. And we use it when teeth are present on both sides of the arch. Now, they don't have to have a complete dentition on both sides, but we have to have something identifiable on both sides. So what do we need for a scan appliance technique? We need scan data, the DICOM either compressed or non-compressed. We need upper and lower stone models or impressions and the bite for the no uh, scan appliance technique and or an, an STL of the digitally scanned arch uh, as you uh, saw me incorporate into software. Uh, Okay, so uh, we went over all the different scenarios as far as uh, scanning appliance technique, no scan appliance technique, and uh, the machine calibrations and what numbers you should look for. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'm going to shift gears and go into what, you know, the mapping of So I think there's about five vital structures that we're really concerned about. That would be the sinus and size of canal, uh, the, the, the lower uh, mandibular uh, nerve, 
we would also look for uh, the lingual artery on cases. Uh, which uh, sometimes uh, is hard to find, but it's pretty identifiable when you know. Sometimes map out the incisive of canal. Not totally necessary because you don't have to stay two millimeters away from it, but in the software it can show you where it's at. It's pretty definitive though, but if you want to map it out, you can. Here it is in an axial view. It's always between the centrals. Uh, you can see it here in th in this view uh, lined up. Here it is in the 3D view, coming through the incisive canal, and in the in the uh, panoramic view down here. Uh, we also have the nasal floor and the turbinates to worry about, and the nasal floor obviously is uh, above the anterior portion of the uh, maxillary arch. Uh, the one reason we like to know where that is and how to use it is that quite a few surgeons and placing doctors like to use the nasal floor as a buttress when implants are screwed in, especially when we have to do bone reduction. And typically that's when it happens, is when we have to do bone reduction for all on fours or overdenture cases where we need space for the appliance. But you can see this implant is sitting right on the cortical bone of the nasal floor in this area. In, in the panoramic view. So uh, you can get more torque on implants when you engage that, if you can engage it, than you would be able to if you didn't engage it. So it's something they, they use as a, as a reinforcement of torque. The turbinates of the nose are here, right above the nasal floor, and this is just your nasal passages here. And we need to recognize those because we don't want to be up in the nasal floor. Um, okay, so the, uh, everybody's familiar with the mandibular mental nerve, the ramifications of that. Well, here it is. I'm going to bring up some live cases and map them out in the software for you so that uh, we know that what to look for and how to, how to take care of that. And the mandibular lingual artery. I left these lines or this marker in place to show you what slice this is in the upper left. But this is the area where the lingual artery is, and here it is. No doctor wants to encounter the lingual artery because it's a major bleeding problem. And it's very hard to stop bleeding when an implant would engage that, uh, that artery. And uh, it's very troublesome for surgeons, and they worry about it a lot, more than, more than they worry about the sinus now. The sinus is not quite as much of a taboo as it used to be in years past. So, I have two cases, one maxillary and one mandibular, and I'm going to uh, open those. I think I will. There we go. Okay, so this is a mandibular case. So how do we uh, find what we're looking for? We have to locate nerves, and we locate nerves from a from the uh, from a combination of the upper middle screen, which is the uh, axial view of the arch. So I'm going to eliminate that. I'm going to draw the dental curve in place for you so you know how to do that. And uh, I will simply, I clicked on this icon for draw dental curve, and I'll go around the arch, and I'll make marks. And it's pretty good to put this equal amount of uh, marks on both sides of the arch. And here we have it. So what the
more. And in the panoramic view, what you'll see is little remnants of the arch. You can see the nerve. You can see part of it and part of it. You until we see as much of the nerves as we can. And now you see the nerve appearing. And we also want to look for the extent of the uh, mandibular, uh, uh, or the anterior loop of the canal, which is right here. The mental foramen is probably right here. This is the loop right here. So. Uh, now on the on the on the on the left side here, the right side, we do the same thing. We manipulate these squares on the spline. Until we see everything we want to see with the nerves. And then we mark the nerve. So up on the icon toolbar at the top, you'll see this nerve with a plus sign on it. And we are going to in its path. I don't get too far apart with these. Okay, that's going to be considered nerve one. And so down on the bottom right or the right side, I'll go to the bottom in this. nerve okay now we also have to worry about mental foramen and you can see uh, the mental foramen in the 3d view here's one here and here's one here we want to see a nerve coming out of there in the software so we have to go to the top left and scroll through this arch until we come to the mental foramen. It's usually going to be in the premolar area. It's going to be coming up right there it is. Sometimes it's faint, sometimes it isn't. There it is. This is the mental foramen itself. And now we can also manipulate these circles so that they are in a better position than what I might have had them in initially. Okay. So let's make there. Now I can move this here right onto the nerve center itself. So that's how we identify that, that uh, particular nerve. So let's add it now. So I'm going to hit add nerve again and we'll go there. Now I'm going to put a dot right here. We can do this in the sagittal view up here to put these nerves in. I'm going to let it extend out a little bit so that now we can see the nerve exiting the mental foramen area in the bone. So we have to find the uh, mental foramen on the right side of the arch. And there it is. So now I'm going to go up. Okay, put my nerve here, 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 and here. And we have a mental foramen nerve ex exiting the uh, bone on both sides. So now we have mapped. Exactly where the nerve is now. Between the mental foramen and the end most anterior portion of the loop, uh, most surgeons and placing dentists accept five millimeters as a criteria. We don't want to get 
closer than five millimeters to the mental foramen on either side of the arch. So on the now let's go to the uh, this is the case that also that had the uh, lingual artery and there it is now if you want to map it out you can just to help yourself see it until you get used to looking at it so I would just hit add nerve here and I'd probably come out right there too. That way it's in the software when you're scrolling through you, you can't miss where it is right here and it just helps you so that you don't place an implant in that site and cause, uh, and cause a problem, cause somebody to bleed excessively. So that is the lower uh, vital structures that we have to worry about. Now we'll go to the uppers. Okay, so let's map out this arch too so that we can do it ourselves. I'm going to turn that off. And as I mentioned before, it, it's it's nice to put this, the software will put the dental curve automatically in for you. I like to put it in myself. I like to determine the arch form that I want to use for it as opposed to what the software gives us. But there's nothing wrong with doing it in the software if that's if that's what you want. Uh, make these pictures enlarge in the software. You just hold the right, right click, right click, and hold the button down, and just move your cursor up and down on the screen, and it'll make these images bigger or smaller. These uh, down here in the bottom right. These. This is a view. Of And there's a standard view. I like the standard view uh, because it gives you a representation of the bone that's pretty clear. But the problem with the standard view is you can distort it and make it look any way you want it to look. And it can tend to make your implant placements look not correct as opposed to these views. The problem here, you can't, well, we can change this view too. It's a little more viewer friendly. And this is just more like an x-ray view that we can change if we want to, too. Okay. So our ridge spline is in place. If you want to move the ridge spline, you can grab this red square and move it down over wherever you want to move it. Okay. This center circle makes it larger. You see how it expands and contracts the ridge spline? So those are two tools that you can use to help yourself uh, and then once you get the spline made, you can you can adjust it, you can change it. Okay, so we have uh, two vital structures on the upper that we have to worry about. One is the incisive canal, and and, and another is the sinus. The sinus is probably the easiest one to find. Uh, we don't map it out. I don't draw lines on it. You can see it. It's outlined by cortical bone you know, behind the, you know, right around the bicuspid uh, area, under the bicuspid area. Some go further forward than others, but it's just outlined by dense cortical bone all around. Okay. And everybody knows that we don't want to place implants in the sinus unless we, unless we have to. Uh, you know, I always like to point things out like this that I see in the square. If I see a periapical lesion around a tooth like we see here uh, and here, uh, I will always point that out even though I th anybody using this software for planning is responsible for any pathology that 
um, is uh, present on this patient and if they miss it they can be liable uh, the doctors that is but this is a pneumatized sinus here and sometimes the surgeons like to get an ENT doctor to take care of that before they start as long as you know if they think they have to do uh, a sinus lift the, the, the uh, incisive of canal is if you look in the top middle corner you see this round circle right here that's the incisive of canal and if you look at the patient view we'll make this bigger it's right here and you can see right down into it now as far as planning is concerned uh, like I said before if you want to outline that if you want to put some yellow marks in there to know where it is you can the, the thing you have to be aware of with this in size of the canal is that you can put an implant right up against the cortical bone that surrounds the incisive of the canal and some surgeons don't even mind going into it and that's something that you need to discuss you need to point out and show them so that uh, they know exactly where they are in relationship to the incisive of the canal and you can scroll back and forth and see that you're not in it and just for the sake of uh, what we're doing right now I'll put I'll put a narrow bodied implant in it and uh, we'll see I'll give you an idea of how you can place these most people are are comfortable being that close to it it's okay I don't know anybody that wouldn't accept that some people you know if you nick it if you if you go into the incisive of canal a little bit they're okay with that too nobody wants a right in the middle so you have to be careful and you have to be in real good communication with the doctor you're planning with to see what their preferences are when it comes to that particular structure so uh, on the upper those are the two things that uh, we need to really pay close attention to and uh, you know find out if your doctor wants to do sinus lifts I always point out um, you know we might be able to do a better plan if we put an implant in back in where we don't have enough bone do a sinus lift uh, let the implant heal so things like that that uh, because you know this anatomy uh, will help doctors make a decision on how they want we have covered all the vital structures and reached the end of my presentation and I will be happy to entertain uh, questions if anybody has them uh, so uh, at this point Michael uh, if you have any questions that I can answer I'd be happy to do that okay if anybody has questions please enter them into the QA box can, Joe can you describe um, those red exclamation marks that we saw previously and how they connect to the vital structures that you were the what marks? The, what validation, mark? the validation tool and the software. Oh, okay. Let me go. All right, the validation tool. Let's get to a different, let's get to something that has more. Yeah, we can put some implants in. The validation tool in the software uh, keeps us honest. Uh, what it does is prevents us from placing implants too close to one another uh, and it has criteria here that you can change the minimum distance to the nerve we have set at two millimeters which is a pretty uh, professionally accepted uh, distance to, to be able to be that close to the nerve and the standard that I find the most common is the space between implants needs to be three millimeters so we can set that to whatever you want just hit the uh, arrow buttons up and down and we can set that but for instance this is uh, this is an all on four case that was planned and uh, it's difficult on these cases where you have angulated implants as part of the plan uh, to use this validation point uh, because doctors aren't concerned as much that they'll, they'll get within a millimeter of an implant at the apex from one to the other as long implants up 
as you see me straighten this up, you saw the icon off. And this one, I'll straighten it up. And as I straighten it up, the icon turns off. So that means that the distance between these two implants is uh, more than three millimeters. So let me do it here. So the icon doesn't turn off there. So I have to move this over more. There, right about there. You know, right there. And now we have the proper spacing. Things aren't correct as far as um, the sinus positions and all that, but you get the idea of what it means uh, and how you can, uh, how this tool helps you determine uh, spacing between implants. And in the 3D view, I'll show you that here. Let me turn the uh, and the surfaces button. I'll, oops, I don't want to do that. Let me just turn it off. So now you can see. Oh, well, wait a minute. That implant's upside down. There. There we go. So now there's no uh, no no problem with spacing between implants. And again, it has everything to do with how close one implant is to the other. Now I straightened this out. I moved it. That means I have to do that. And now it's correct. So you just manipulate the implants around until uh, until the icons don't show up at whatever default distance you've placed in the software. I mean, you can make them get uh, make the icon appear. Now we're less than three millimeters apart. And the distance is going to be measured from the closest point of an implant. It can be at the apex or the coronal. Whatever uh, point is closest to that implant, then the adjacent implant is where that distance is going to be measured. So let's go down. Let's uh, find a nerve. Here's our, okay. So I'll put an implant in here. Mandible, let's do a 3, 5 by 15. So I'm going to put this right here. You can see the icon showed up right away. And so I'm going to put this in a crestal position. I'll click on it. Here's the uh, implant in the sagittal view. And you can see that no icon appeared. But if I come closer, 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 there's our icon. So right there, we're closer than two millimeters to the nerve. And right here where it turned off, I think, let me make sure, yeah, we're validated. So right now, we don't have to worry about how close we are to that nerve because we know we're further than two millimeters away from it. So those are how the, that tool works to make sure that we you know, keep every keep us honest with our implant placements and, and not have any uh, problems with uh, vital structures. And at this point, in all the years we've uh, been doing this, we have not encountered uh, any vital structure violations that was were not planned for. Now we never ever planned to put one in the nerve, but we've planned to to do sinus lifts and and things of that nature, which cause us to go into the sinus. So, okay. Any... Wanting to see with that? Um, I think because we're already running over time, we're going to wrap things up. Um, a few comments. First of all, everybody should make sure to enter their details into the webinar attendance form. The link was sent out with the viewing links. It also appears below the viewing window. Put your details in so we're able to send you the CE credits as well. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and should be live on YouTube and on our website shortly after the presentation is over. Uh, if there are additional questions, Joe could be contacted. Um, their website's rodentalab.com and their phone number is on the screen now. We could be contacted Blue Sky Bio via plan at bluesky.bio.com. 
I think the webinar presentation is ex uh, this particular presentation is extremely important. Often we see situations where we want to get the treatment plan done, we want to get the patient dealt with, we want to get the surgical guide fabricated, and some of the fundamental steps regarding the quality of the CT scan, the settings, and properly setting up the case uh, sometimes is glossed over, and of course that could have effect on the case performance and the end results. So we want to definitely keep that in mind, uh, all the points that Joe has pointed out here. Um, Joe, I want to thank you for the presentation. Like we said at the beginning, this is the first of a four webinar series that Road Dental Lab and Joe is going to be presenting on guided surgery. So stay tuned for information regarding the others. The registration links and details can be found on the Blue Sky Bio website and also will be sent out uh, via email. Uh, Joe, thank you very much and thanks everybody for attending. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Good night, all. Have a good evening.